All right. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Achrei uh, Mot. The, the topics now this time are multiple. Are we doing Achrei Mot Kedoshim or Achrei Mot Alav? I think it's Achrei Well, it's Achrei Mot Kedoshim, I guess. I suppose so. That's the way we read the Shabbos. So, I mean, if you find something in either one of those Rashi or so my goodness. There, there are 12 topics in one of them and 9 topics in the other one. Okay, so let's see. Sorry, I'm just we don't really need to write and run. And we mentioned Dean, and Kamadan, and we saw Kamadan, and Kamadan, and we saw Kamadan, and we saw Kamadan, and we saw Kamadan, and we saw Kamadan, and we Tam Lachom Arisunida, Tam Ashetaki Arza, Tereshra, Lachit Amrit Nashem, Return Mishar, Arzot Biulada, Baha, the Dar Kusak Misha. Oh, well, there's one, <laughs> you might not like this, because why, he says, the reason why people who transgress uh, terrible crimes in Eretz Israel will more likely be ejected from the country before God more than from other countries. The explanation that a person who lives in Chutzlaritz is like a person who is living without a god. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, this discussion about Eretz Yisrael being especially... We, we did a little bit of that last time. Remember about, about Sarat? Oh, Sarat. Sarat. In Eretz Yisrael. He was saying in crimes in general, the land does not tolerate as much as, let's say, American towers we are doing here, right? Um, that's one topic. Um, oh, and, and connected to that is the difference between doing mitzvot here in Mansi and doing mitzvot in Eretz Israel. The same mitzvot? Same mitzvot. The difference. The different, it's a different... For example, keep on shot, keep on keeping Shabbat, Shabbat yeah. here is not the same as keeping Shabbat there. Putting on film here is not the same as putting film on there. Okay. I mean, which has something to do with the same topic that we just said. Right. Um, mm. Three levels, we once talked about this, three levels in karet. Mm -hmm. If you remember once upon a time, we talked about how we talked about once upon a time, how it is not necessary to discuss that a soul is infinite and will always be forever. It's not necessary to discuss that because by definition that's true because God is infinite and the Shama, a person, is infinite, right? The only thing is that there is, and we know that from the fact that the Torah doesn't even tell you that the soul is infinite. The only thing the Torah does tell you is the very, very rare exception in which there is a punishment of karet, whatever that means, right? But one of the explanations of karet is that a person is cut off. Because the Torah has to tell you of the unusual situation where a person is cut off, you know from that that everybody else is not. I mean, yeah, so he has a discussion about karet. What is the nature of karet and what is it? Are different levels of karet, three different levels. Um, and the promise, the great promise of the reward in the world to come. And why the Torah did not even bother talking about it about Olam Abba in the Torah itself. Mm -hmm. And instead, discuss only rewards in this world. Mm -hmm. You get good rain, you get good food, your animals will be healthy, you know, you'll have children, the all the things in this world. Help. And it doesn't, even talk about, it doesn't even talk about the future, about uh, the type of life to come. Okay, so those are three distinct topics maybe in Akhrei Mot. Do you want to do them, or should I continue to summarize the, what in Kedoshim? Okay, the, the, the in, intolerance of the land and the doing of a mitzvot being different. I mean, those are two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, right. Um, and that is in chapter 18, verse 25. You have a Bible? Yes. Chapter chapter eighteen verse twenty five. Okay. Eight, eighteen. Eighteen twenty five. Twenty five. Eighteen twenty five. Eighteen. 
Boy, Perla sounded like really. I was, it's like it's the same table with us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can always. Yeah. It's lovely. Lovely. It would be very nice too. Yeah. So, first eight twenty-five, and then. Umin. Kuftet. We have to basically look at the Ramban on <clears throat> page Kuftet. 109 and 10. Uh, all the way. All the way. Nine, yeah. Okay, so we, we start. First, close to 1825. 1825. You got that, right? So far? Am I right? 1825. It says like this, if you do all these terrible things, you will defile the land, 24. Do not defile the land. Don't become defiled by all of these things. They're talking before this about all kinds of sexual perversions. Animal uh, sex and, uh, and, and, and uh, homosexuality and, uh, and taking somebody else's wife and uh, incest and so on. All these terrible things. And then it says in chapter in verse 24, So that you already see, these are the things that the nations did before you that has caused me to disperse them from the land. So you notice that, hmm, you notice that the land of Israel, which he's going to talk about, is not only intolerant of Jewish in a, of immorality. It's intolerant of anybody's immorality. That's something interesting to, to notice, right? I mean, he says, these are the things that the nations did. That's why you're coming here to take their place, because I'm sending them out because of this kind of behavior. Manyan. That titmah ha'aretz and the land became defiled, whatever that means. How does land become defiled? I mean, after all, people become defiled, right? Who talks about land? This is obviously what the Ramban is going to discuss, right? It's, a, it's peculiar to talk about land becoming defiled. You walk outside over there on the ground and you do something terrible on the ground. So you'd say, the people did something wrong, but the, what, the earth over here is now defiled. I mean, how do we understand that exactly, right? So, and I have judged, I have decided to judge that sin against her, I guess, Aleha. And she, the land, spit out, regurgitated. It's a big word. Vataki is not just spit, it's vomited out the people who dwell on her. Right? And you, and it follows on to verse 28, you notice, and, and therefore you should not behave that way because that way the land will not spit you out when you defile her, just like it vomited out the other people, the late nations before you. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So, he's going to discuss that idea. So if you look at, um, at the Ramban on that Hasu, right, in 20, verse 25, Kuftet in you. So he says like this, what is Right? Right. We have become, the, the, the Pasuk has become very stringent, very strict about Arayot, these perversions, because of the land. What does that mean? She becomes defiled by them. And it, it regurgitates those people who do it. So this is a question, right? You want to talk about, let's say, Shemitah. So, halacha in the land. Yeah. So if you don't keep the Shemitah, the land might become insulted because you're supposed to do this land in Mitzvah, right? Maybe, right? You're supposed to plant things in a certain way, no, no client. So the land might be insulted if you do something wrong on the land. But he said, listen, these things that we're talking about, perversion, sexual perversions, are people things. People things. They're not subject to the land. So why is the land getting accepted? Right? What's the land got to do with people's misbehavior? These questions, right? Aval, 
but I'll tell you a secret. So that I, Bakatu, Shamar, the Hanchel Elion Goim, the Hafido Bene Adam, Yatsev Vulot Amin, and so on and so on. This is a Pasuk 74, footnote 74, the Pasuk in Divari, in Zoda uh, Bracha, right? When God dis- div- decided how to apportion the lands of the world, because the nation Israel is a portion of God. It's like a possession of God, right? And the, and the matter means God created everything. And he placed the power over the lower worlds in the hands of the upper worlds, whatever that means, right? Like the planets and the uh, and all of the universe has an impact on what goes on here, right? Now you have to put yourself in the mind of medieval thinkers when you talk about this, that astrology, astrology. certain kinds of powers out there, a certain star is the star of the Egyptians, and a certain con- you know, constellation is the constellation of the French, and, uh, you know, and what does that mean to him? In those days he used to think that there is a influence, there is an impact, there is a control of the events that happen to a certain nation, to a certain place, ha- in the hands of one of these astrological uh, forces, powers, right? And God himself, he's saying, ran the world that way, runs the world that way. He gives the job to Mars to do that. And he gives the job to Mercury to do that. You know what I mean? God is on top of it all, and he gives this job. Let's let's go on. And of course, listen, we who do not believe, I hope, do not believe in astrology, I hope, Am I right? Am I speaking for us? Yes, sir. <laughs> no, I think so. <laughs> you're, not, you're not sure you're speaking, you're speaking for us? <laughs> well, if we who do not believe in that might translate this idea that there is natural forces. You can call He calls it astrology. Right, astrology. I'll call it natural forces. There are natural forces that control, that have an impact on everybody's life. Right? So he's saying that uh, say Mars, the planet of more um, has the um, influence, a warlike influence, on the on um, of on certain nations. They, well, I'm not sure if, if he would talk about Mars. Some kochav, I mean, I just made up Mars. He didn't say Mars, right? But some kochav has dominion. That's what he's saying. Dominion, Adonai Adonai, right? Adon. Um, um, right? Mm-hmm. He gave Natan al Kol Amba Amba Arzotam le Goyem Kochav Umazal Yadua Kasher no Dabi Samirut. Right? Whatever that is. Whatever, I, I don't know the names of these things because I don't know astrology, right? But they used to believe that there were national astrological forces. Vezeu Shenemar Sheh Chalak Hashem Elohecha Otam le Chol Amin. If you remember, there are some very strange psukim that talk about the Jews, you must not worship other gods like stars and the moon and the stars and the sun because God had not apportioned you to those gods like he did the other nations. Now, you know, to, to the person who first reads it, things like maybe God is saying that he forbids idol worship to everyone. No, not just to the Jews. But he seems to be saying in those Tukim, and the way the Ramban understands it is that the other nations, it's okay for them to understand that they are under the dominion of some force out there, because it is so. God actually gave their life to be under the dominion of that, rather than directly by God, right? Not that they do anything God would want them to do, but he lets them, they he lets them flow. flow. He yeah. lets them flow. Those, those forces go... Let's say gravity, right? Gravity works all the time, so God doesn't necessarily tell gravity to make that ball fall every moment when the ball is falling. 
but God created the world in such a way that there is such a force that makes the ball fall, right? So let's assume, I mean, we're talking about this in astrological terms, God creates uh, the kind of situation where certain people are under a certain kind of natural history. The natural history will be governed by this natural thing, but, and he's going to explain that's true for all the nations of the world. Um, I know, right? I know gravity is a good example. It, uh, well, I don't know what you want to call. <laughs> well, if you want to graduate to astrology, then you have to get spooky. I'm trying to be more concrete. Gravity applies to Jews as well. Yeah. Well, so let's say probability. Probability, right? Probability is one of the rules in mathematics, right? If I, you have a hundred people, right? They will fight against one man. These hundred people will usually defeat that one man, right? That's natural. You want to write the probability. The probability is close to 100%, right? That they will do this. They will. The natural law of the way the nations work is that it goes by probability. Uh, let's finish these few sentences yeah, and we'll see what does apply, right? Yeah. He gave a portion to all of these people to be under a certain signs in the world and angels which were given to be officers over them, to be dominion over them. This is Daniel who talks about, you know, he saw the, the ministering angel of Paras, of Persia. And then he sees the ministering angel of, of Greece yeah, coming. They're called angels. Okay, good. However, he is really the master of the entire world. He is, what do we mean by Elohei Elohim? He's the God of the gods. The gods. Well, we don't know that there's any other gods. We don't believe that there are other gods. So what do we mean when we say, who Elohei Elohim? God. He means these, these, these people that are masters are sometimes called gods. We, we, the word Elohim is also often used for people who are powerful and almighty. Mighty, right? But Eretz Israel, Emtsaut Hayishuv, he, I'm sorry, Emtsaut Hayishuv, it is, I guess, like the belly button of the world. It's the center. It's under the central line. The, yeah? Okay, fine. It's the center of the universe, Eretz Israel, he's saying. The center of existence. He, Nachalat Hashem Miyuchad Lishmo. She is, the land of Israel, a inheritance of God designated specially for him. Again, the Zohar. Uh, do I understand any word there? He has a footnote here, a quote from the Zohar to this effect. Okay. Lo natan aleha min ha-malachim katsin shoter u-moshel. Hashem did not appoint over her, a, over the land of Israel, a officer, a dominion angel, a whatever force, right? Does not. Behanchilo otal la-amol ha-miyached shemo zera avahav. When he inherited, gave us an inheritance, the land of Israel to his nation, that is singular, also a single nation, very special nation, the children of his beloved, right, the ones who loved him, and that is what is meant, you have been to me a chosen, you will be to me chosen ones from among all the nations, because all the land is mine. Now that's, by the way, Pinky, a very difficult pursuit. Yeah. What are you trying to do? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the rays down there and the ant down there. And the, uh, so there's an ant. So it's okay. Are you worried about the ants? <laughs> They're not even one of the plagues, you know. <laughs> an ant is, uh, it, it is. It is a creature. It's one of the creatures of God walking around yeah. trying to find some food. You know, right. 
It's a weird one. It's a weird one. Yeah, you weren't listening because you were looking at it. I was, I was listening. Oh. But so uh, he, it, it, the land of Israel, of Israel, is bequeathed to his singular people, yeah. who are the children of the ones who love him. And that is what he meant when he said, and he did not appoint over this land any other force. He himself directly takes care of it, right? And to, so he relates to his people, he relates to his land without intermediaries, right? right? Without intermediaries. And that's what's meant, the What does that mean? That pasuk is very interesting, right? It is in, uh, in Yitro or Bo. Hashem sends to, to Moshe, listen, I, you saw that I took you out of Egypt, I brought you to this place to be near me, right? To be close to me. And now if you will listen to my voice, you will be to me a chosen people from all the nations. Then the next words are hard. Kili kol ha'aretz, because all the land is mine. Is that a key? Is that a is that an argument for you being chosen because all the land is mine? Um, it, it, it seems like a non sequitur. You will be a nation unto me more than all the other nations because I own all the diamonds in the world. I mean, what kili kol ha'aretz? There's no because. There's no because there, right? So he's trying to explain Kiliko Laharitz means even though the land is all mine, all the other nations that are on the world, I have given the forces to all of them to take care of them. Right? And in that way I ran the whole world until now. But from now on, I'm going to take you out of that mix. And I'm going to have you for me. I mean, Kiliko Haaretz means that's the way I usually run. That's the way, yeah. That despite the fact that it's all mine, I give it to intermediaries. That's the way I treated uh, you too? That's the way I treated that. What? That's the way I treated you too? Till now. Yeah. All right? So Kiliko means Kiliko Haaretz. Where am I? Yes. He's not going to be Elohim to you. He's going to be Elohim to you. Right? He's not going to be the Lord of all the mighty, he's going to be your God. So we say, we see already that there are mighty, there are other mighty, there are mighty, beings, mighty beings. Under his control. Command. command. Right. Under his command. Right. Which is it? He made sure that he told you that before. Shu Elohe Elohim. Right? Ki local Iris. Because he really is on top of it all. Right? I mean, he said that before, right? Uh, Right? That's the way. He is really on top of all those bosses. He, he appoints bosses. These are vice presidents. Right? He gives them the power to do things, to, to run things for those. But he says, for us, for the Jewish people, he will not do it that way. Right? You will not be under any other forces at all. Uh, can we understand that Hashem push the, another nation to be under these powers? Or this because the nation chose to be under these powers? As us before Abraham Abim, because we, are, we were all under the, the power of these nations. That sounds like every, that was the natural thing to do, is to be under these powers. All along, the whole, the whole world. He's saying to the Jewish people, "Listen, this is the way I run." Yeah, but, but my question now is: I'm, now I'm taking you out. Them. Now I'm taking you out of the place where everybody else was. You could say not push. Maybe he gave a, an opportunity to all those other nations to be under his own dominion if they would have taken the Torah. I don't know when he, when he gave the Torah to all the nations. I don't know. He doesn't say it, no. but but he does seem to say that the world, the way the world normally runs, he didn't have to push anybody to be under this. The way the normally world run, how, how does God control grass? How does God control mice? Or the ants over there, right? Does he put his finger and say, all oh, every grass to grow? Or does he have a, a natural system that supports grass, that gives life to ants? Right? In general, right? In general. And therefore, that's what works with them, and it might work. I don't want to bring an insult to French people or to American people, but 
as very, very smart, illustrious human beings. We're not talking about, they're not like ants, right? But the destiny of France works according to what you'd expect in nature. I mean, you know, Herzog wrote a big essay about the Jewish people's existence clearly is not governed by probabilities, right? Because we would have been, we shouldn't be existing. We shouldn't be around, right, by, by natural law. So I'm just trying, I'm using my language instead of astrology. I'm saying, you know, God controls Jewish events. Well, why, Israeli why, uh, national events. There's no, no, no really a stupid question. Why did an earthquake happen? In, uh, because the world, that's the way the world goes. Nepal. Nepal. Because that's the way the world goes. The Rambam, the Rambam talks about this. Some people say, some people say, you know why the earthquake happened there? Because God is angry. Yeah, because I don't watch it. Yeah, because I don't watch it. I better people to be angry at. Yeah, so you could be better angry. You could be angry at Assad instead of Tibet. No? Or about Sudan instead of Tibet. How come the... So some people still say this, you know, the tsunami happened in uh, Thailand because God was angry. I mean, but, so the Rambam talks about this. He says this is a myth. It's a myth. But sometimes it's a useful myth. Because if people think that you have to be careful to do this and this because God might be angry, then they behave, then they behave better. But it's absolutely a false idea about God. God doesn't get angry, first of all. He says, altogether, it's not even a thing we can express. But he says, when people see a flood, it is, you know, strong and powerful and destructive, they say, oh, this must be an expression of God's anger. Mm -hmm. A fire breaks out. Oh, it must be an expression oh, of God. Yeah, and he says that that's false, totally false, because God plants in the world, and I'm telling you, paraphrase away, he says it more in Ruhi, God plants in the world these events and these powers that are natural, and he says, for the most part, goodness comes from them, not bad. Rarely bad. What do I mean by that? You know, in order to have a tsunami, or let's say the other way, in order to have rain fall on Muncie, you have to have a tsunami. In order to have warm weather in Florida, you have to have freezing weather in the, another place in the, in the planet. In order to have moisture here, you have to have a hurricane there. The system, you know, when you look at the globe, right, these air is moving, water is evaporating from the sea, it goes into the clouds, there is winds moving, they bring them to another place, right, and sometimes there's turbulence, and it's natural. If you didn't want tsunamis, you couldn't have plants growing in uh, Minnesota. Now, you might ask, not a bad question to ask, God, why do you have to make a world in which there has to be both of those things, earthquakes and and good things. Anybody have to break that one? You know, our planet is, the center of our planet is super, super hot, right? Mm -hmm. Always cooking, you know, and it creates volcanoes and it creates earthquakes and it creates all kinds of things. Why do we have to have a world like that? Well, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have warmth, right? We wouldn't have minerals, we wouldn't have new earth developing all the time. I mean, new earth is developed by, by volcanoes. So it's, a, it's very complex, it's very fascinating. But it so happens that it's true. If we didn't have people die of cancer, we wouldn't be able to have a population that continues to renew itself all the time. I mean, it's, no, it's a mystery why God wants a world like that. Like that. That it needs these things in order for that, for good things to happen. But mostly good. You say, mostly good, if you look at it, the big picture. We should be trying to um, uh, defeat cancer. Yeah, right, we are. We're trying to defeat cancer. Because, well, it's our job to do that, but you know, the price might be another price to pay. You know, for example, we're gonna, in order to defeat cancer and have more people living, we will also have to be ingenious enough to grow much better food. You know? And so, genetic engineering for rice that will feed so much more people. 20, 40 years ago, when you and I were in college, they were talking about the fact that the world was to have a population explosion and people will starve. And since then, we've had the population explosion and people are not starving. What happened? 
the people had doomsday. Every once in a while, it's had a catastrophe. Now it's global warming. Global warming is going to destroy the planet, right? Yeah. We, yeah, not this, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, but there's a certain limit to what the world can supply. And we see that twice the limit already mm -hmm. from what they were talking about. So, human ingenuity, human job is to improve the world all the time. I don't know why God had to produce that. Maybe, maybe it's possible that there has to be suffering in the world in order that we should be able to appreciate goodness better. Maybe there has to be suffering in the world because it would make us more empathetic, it would make us achieve chesed, to overcome our own satisfaction with ourselves and look to somebody else's benefit. Those are all midot that God wants to have. If everybody was, you know, like in Shangri-La, you know, yeah. then maybe we would never grow up. But of course, for the guy who is dead under a pile of stones in Tibet, it doesn't make him very happy to know, oh, you know what, I died because the world has to be a better place with uh, my death. Mm -hmm. So how, does, how do you make him happy? So, I like to imagine, if you permit me to be totally ridiculous, I, I would like to imagine that when that person dies, he goes up, his soul goes up, and God meets him, and... Uh, God says to him, uh, hello. So the man says, God, why did you let me die like that? Why did you let me die like that? You're such a wonderful God, why did you let me die like that? He said, well, he tries to explain to him a little bit. He says, you may not understand, but you died in an earthquake so that the whole world can continue to roll along the way I wanted it to roll along, and that people should have freedom, and people should have empathy, and people should have all those things. He tries to explain to him. That's very nice, but do I have to be the sacrifice for your job to make the world the way you want? It's not fair. Why do I have to be the one to take the pay the price? It's a good question, yeah? Some girl walks in Central Park and she gets raped and she gets killed. So why did God permit that? Because he wanted free will and because he wanted us to have the impetus to protect society and to make the society better because this and this and this and this. So the girl goes up and he says, "What? Well, so you wanted that? So I have to be die. I have to die over it because you wanted the world to learn a lesson and to go to to be to grow and to be better." So he says, "You know, you're right. From your point of view, it is not fair. So I'll tell you what. Why don't you come up over here, sit next to me, and I will make it up to you." God probably knows how to make it up to people for being part of this. His solution to you. So yeah. I'm, not in this world, I'm sure, but uh, maybe. Maybe he gives them another life. In the same way that in the they would be the happy happy and Avi cool, because they were chosen by God. So in order to us to understand what is the meaning yeah, of Yeah, but, but, but why should they have to be the ones chosen? That's the question. Why do they have to be? They will ask the question, right? Everybody can ask that question. So, I don't know, maybe he make, you, if, you, if you believe that people have a second life, maybe he gives them a life that is just unbelievable next time. Or maybe he knows how to make a reward in the world to come that, is, that makes this life an instant, you know, and is in time. Anyway, but we got off the topic. He says, however, that unlike the rest of the world, you're going to be under me, right? You will not be under the other bosses at all. So he sanctified the people who live on his land in the sanctity of these perversions, that they will be refrained from that, right? That they will be away from that. And many of the mitzvot, in order to be you know, belonging to him, to his name. Lachach, Amar Ushmartemet Kochutot Kotai. That's why he told them, You keep all of my commandments and Mishpatai and my judgments, Fasitemotam, Velotaki Artetem, and the land will not spit you out. Meaning there's a relationship between you and me and the land and me, and you keep the three mitzvot and this, our, our three part trio. You know, Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Kutcha Brichu, Chadru. They're just one. Right? If you want to know about a trinity, that's the, that's the Jewish trinity. Right? Viktiv, you like that uh, thinking? Viktiv, 
ואמר להיכן, אתם תרשו את אדמתי, you will inherit my land, ואני אתנן עליכם, and I will give it to you to inherit it, אני השם אלוקיכם אשר הבדלתי אתכם מן העמים, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the rest of the nations, again a, spe- a, a non sequitur, right? I will give you my land, and you will be my people, right? I am the God who separated you from the other nations. Why, why does he have to say, I am the God who separated you from the nations when, the other, when he talks that way? Because he's trying to say, this relationship I have with you is different from the way I relate to everyone else, right? Yomar, ki hivdil otanu mikol ha'amim ha'shanatan alahem sarim elohim acherim. Again, the implication is that he's going to make us different from all the other nations whom have, who have of, over them his appointment of other bosses. By giving us the land, He gave us the land so that we will be special to him and we will sanctify his name, singular, singular his name. And so this land now that is the inheritance of God, five lines from bottom of page Kuftet, where we started. Very, very, very good. Very, uh, six lines in the right. This land cannot tolerate that kind of behavior because, again, it is special directly before God. This parsha, this is what Remember? The Molech, which will be described in a moment, in Zicharon Arayot, together with perversions. This is the severity of the of idol worship. Because the Jewish people are singled out to his for his name, that's why he gave this this land, this land which is also singly related to him. You see, Ani Hashem Alokechem is connected to Lareshe Again, he's trying to make always the combination obvious to us that the relationship to God is the relationship to the land. You have a relationship to the land because you're related to God. Asher Yidalti Yetchem Yina Amin, that I made you different from them. Hine, here it is. Bechutzel Aretz, in the external months. Afapi Shakol Lashem Anichbad, even though everything belongs to God, ain't taharaba shlema. Its purity is not complete. Ba'avur ha Because of this distance, this secondary control that is going on here. And the nations make a mistake. They are really, let's say, the sun controls me. Yeah, if, if, I, if I am a Frenchman, right? Let's say the sun controls me. So they think that I have to worship the sun because the sun must be an independent God that controls me, right? That's how idol worship begins. They don't understand that it's true that the sun is controlling our events, right? But the sun is a servant of the one who created it and gives them the power, gives him the power over it. So I should worship the God who made the sun, not sun, right? But people make this mistake because they really are under the dominion of the sun, and so they think, oh, you know, he's the one who really independent rules me, right? But they make this mistake. Eventually they will get over that. We say that in the, in the prophets, that they will eventually learn that this is not so, right? The, the knowledge of God will fill the world like the sea, like the water, like the sea. the Right? He actually controls it all. He can actually destroy or change like he did in Yitzhak Mitzrayim, let's say, right? What does that mean? When God acted out against the gods of Egypt. God doesn't have to do a war against God. 
right? Because uh, those gods are nothing, right? But he means to say that he turned over, he changed the, the natural yeah. forces that he had given to rule over Egypt. He played games with them, right? To change I don't know what that is. That's a quote from 99. Do you have it there? Daniel. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it means. It's a passage from Daniel. And maybe uh, it's a translation of it. Wakeful ones. Wakeful ones. Anshelta, the sentence. Like the word of the Holy Ones? No, no, no. That which was decreed on the Ruchan Netzar, he gzerat irin pit gama, umamar kedishin, she'elta, she'gazu alakachot ha ne'etzalim mehem. Do you understand any word here? Lasot kach. Lemala kichalat v'tkova, yeah, okay. God appoints these forces, and from them comes all the powers in the world, in the natural order of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see, maybe we could skip a couple of things about the mitzvot, right? This is Daniel. Let's skip along a little bit. Let's skip a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. So, this does, does mean that Nebuchadnezzar was worshipping grass or something? Don't know. What, what? Oxen? I'm trying to some. Oh, you have to leave the room for a moment. I'm going to bed. That's okay. 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 Is there some other things for that? Um, let's go on a little bit, one moment. This, this is now talking about other nations, which is way a second. Oh, let's go. Eretz Israel Enoch Keshara Aratzot. The land of Israel is not like other lands. Do you see that somewhere there? Yes. Enami Kayemet of Le'ar Abeirat. It does not tolerate transgressors. So therefore, like I said before, it's a little dangerous to live in Israel. It's going to be great. And you are one with God and one with the life. Best, right? But if you're not going to be so great, then it's better to be a Nazi because you're a But you as Jews, you as Jews, no? Uh, somebody else living in Israel. That's right, but because you, you weren't chosen by God. But you would be fine. You, you can live in Israel. You, so you can live in Israel. It's okay. Yes, but, but you are not going to affect it very much, right? You're not going to be chosen by God just because you're in Israel. If you misbehave there, you will be tolerated less than if you're here. So. Yeah, I think about how to live. Oh, yeah. This is the MR. The only more help is how to load there. We should let that be sorry, not the body for that. Right? Any more help is how. There is no other God with him. What does that mean with him? Do you think that maybe there's another God with him? With him? No. It means to say that no one else shares in the forces and the powers over you, the Jewish people. And this is what is meant to say. When somebody lives outside of Eretz Israel, it is though he doesn't have a God. It's as though he doesn't have a God. I give you the land of Israel to be your God. I give you the land of Israel to be your God. That means. If you don't go to the land of Israel, then I won't be there, so to speak. Right? So what does he mean by that? He says, "Yeah, I give you the land of Israel to be your God." That means you go to the land of Israel, and you will be The prophet says, "Because they chase me out of the inheritance of God, out of the Jewish, out of the land of Israel, to say to me, go and worship other gods." Now, it doesn't mean worship other gods. It means be under the dominion of other bosses. Right? The Amaro, the Sifra, the Abuver Zabra, the Rebbe of Eber Shakti, the Shalom of Eber David, the Yashem of Eber. Oh, Abba Yaakov said to God, if you take care of me when I go, remember when you're going to Laban, and you bring me back to my father's house, and you, God, will be my God, 
For some people interpret that as a condition. When? Then I will then you will be my God. He said, no, it's natural, right? When I am outside the land of Israel, God is not really my God because He's not the Elohim that is over me, directly, right? Bring me back to the land of Israel, then Hayyam Hashem be Elohim, then He will be my God again. Okay. He takes he's care of me. He's leaving the land of Israel. He's, he's leaving Israel. from God. That's right. So when you bring me back, God will be my God. I mean, it is, it's fact, by definition. He's not, he's not promising to do something in exchange for that. Everybody asks this question, what do you mean, Yaakov? You mean you're making a deal with God, but if he takes care of you, then he will be your God. If he doesn't take care of you, he's not going to be your God. So you say, no, no, this is natural, right? In every Israel, you have Elohim, God himself, directly. And you're outside of Israel, it's as though you're not, because it's under the control of another being that he has appointed over you. So if you bring me back to the land of Israel, then you will be my God. All the way at the bottom of Kufu. He tries to explain these phrases that mean when you bring me back to the land of Israel, then you will be my God. Yaakov said, right? Go here, la take la chemed eretz Canaan. Calls man she atem ba eretz Canaan. He eat them. We eat. I eat the la chemed Elohim. I give you the land of Israel to be your God. But. If you are not in the land of Canaan, then, so to speak, I am not your God. In this way that I'm talking about, right? 40,000 went out to fight before God, and the land was conquered before God and before His people. Do you think that the land that the Jewish people are actually uh, um, conquering the land before God? So long as they are on the land, it is as though it is conquered. If they're not on it, then it's not Nukubesh. It's a big, big debate about what is the set of Israel, the land of Israel, the Jews are right. Mm -hmm. is it, does it still belong to the Jewish people? They say no. What do you want to the Jewish people if they're living somewhere else and say, you know, the land of Israel is mine. That's my land, that's my country. Right? <laughs> He's obviously as quite a Zionist, right? He says, you have no right to call Israel your land if you're not there. So why Hashem, um, why Hashem asked, um, Yahoo to buy a certain piece of land, piece of land in order to win, come back to so encourage to encourage the people because they were so depressed and they would be knowing that when the destruction of the this was before the destruction right? before the destruction of the temple and the Galut that will come, he wants him to show that here is a man who knows that the destruction is going to come, but he's going to pay money to have a piece of land in this area. You wouldn't buy a stock in a company that's going bankrupt, right? So you're saying, I want you to show them that you have the hope and the belief that one day they will come back to you. It doesn't make a change in the status of land. He, the Israel, will have a piece of land. But the land of Israel will not belong to the Jewish people until they come back. Right? Says, you know why we do mitzvot? To practice. The land of Israel is where the mitzvot are really mitzvot. Outside of the land of Israel, it's like you have no God. So why do you put on the if you have no God? So you know, very soon we're going to go back to Israel. And I don't want to forget how to get it on and what it feels like. And I was very used to it. It's a very, I mean, this kind of statement that some Yeshiva Bapha would say that, they would throw him out of the class, right? right. <laughs> so I, don't want, I don't want to see you in another way. In another way, this, this, this <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is like an anti Zionist. Anti Zionist? Seeing us today, it's <laughs> Yeah, because he's insane that he's, he's pushing people to actually do something to go back. That's real, right? You know, Zionism is a dream about their Israel being our land. Right, right. And mitzvot, would you believe us? Right? 
Mashal Adon Shekas on Ishto. He's going to give you a story. This is why the man threw out his wife. We shall call a bit of here. And he says, Go back to your father's house. Amar la, Hebei mitkashet et takshitim, Shetakziri, Shetakziri, Lo yu ala chadashim. In the meantime, even though I'm, you're no longer the queen. You're no longer the queen. Go back to your And he's a poor man too. So I want you to know. Put down your room. Places. We're royal clothing every day, even though you're out there. And you're not in the palace anymore, you're not the queen, nobody bows down to you. But do it anyway, so that when you come back to me, it will be natural. It will be able to So we put on food and we do the tour. He says, just be used to it. Not to get out of the you make the special jewelry, that is our mitzvot, that Israel is. You know what? You only are chayev, you only obligated, I shouldn't have used the word jewelry. You only have on all of the mitzvot outside of Eretz Yisrael, only, only those which are on your things that you do with your body, like Tfilin and Zuzot. You understand? They shall be you chadashim aleinu, kishem akzor la'aretz. Ki ikar kol ha-mitzvot I don't know what he meant by that. No mechayim lo, ela b'chubat. You know that it shouldn't be new for us. Because the fundamental in the core of the mitzvot is for those who live in there, as I said. You notice? You go to inherit the land, you dwell in it, and then keep the mitzvot. He thinks that that's a sequence. That's a natural sequence, that one results in the other. Shivat Eretz Yisrael, Shabbat and Megan Abitzot Shabbat Yisrael. Living in Eretz Yisrael is as important as, measured as important as the entire world. I they thought to him, and they meant it. They said, listen, if a master sent out a servant, and he frees him, so he no longer is master, right? So he had to tell them, listen, he might be right in technical terms, but you be sure, because you're going to go back, I'm not going to let you go. You're still a part of the God's name. Alright, <laughs> Okay, so then he tries to tell you to figure it out that Eretz Yisrael is so holy that they don't tolerate these people. Yaakov married two to two sisters. Not a lot. But this was in Kutzah. So he came to Israel. And as he was born in Kutzah and Kutzah, he said, Rachel died. So that he will not have two sisters. Because then it's very slow to stick them out. It was for a month, that's why.